I uh, welcome Nika. you all. Yes. And your Excellencies, uh, uh, I would like to welcome you to, to the forum. Uh, it is great pleasure of having so many participants uh, here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mika Altola, uh, the director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, and I'm participating from, from Helsinki. Uh, I've been following, as we all have, uh, closely the Corona situation and the worsening of it, and, and one of the key observations that I have made has to do with the uh, uh, political ramifications of of uh, uh, COVID-19 situation. And I would like to make some welcoming uh, remarks on 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 that uh, on those observations. It has been exceptional shock uh, COVID-19, and that is not only because of its uh, severity. Uh, a health, uh, it is a health crisis matching the, the fallout from the Spanish flu, and it has compounded uh, economic crisis unrivaled in this time. Uh, in a world challenged by COVID-19, leaders will have to adapt to a host of rapidly evol evolving challenges and opportunities. The cascading issues, not to mention only the economy, have to do with uh, societies, the societal clue and the trust levels in different societies. Uh, COVID-19 gives us an X-ray of the cohesion of particular European societies. On, a, on the international level, the growing trend among leaders has been competition rather than cooperation, uh, although there has been signs of, of uh, compassion solidarity as well. COVID-19 shock has prompted an economic collapse very fast uh, that has been unrivaled, as mentioned before. The opinion polling results show severe drops in interpersonal and institutional trust in the uh, in number of European countries. However, this has not been a general trend in the Nordic Baltic region, and this is a little bit different. Uh, in, 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 in this neck of the woods. But polling data also suggests a rallying effect around scientific expertise and uh, uh, incumbent uh, governments, those governments that are in power currently. During the first wave, the populist positions were losing ground in different Western uh, democratic countries and especially in, 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 in the European uh, Union. Trust in police, experts and scientists has gone up. The data also has hinted 
at a grow, a growing demand for competence. And I would like to repeat this word, competence, competent governance. The map of disease spread has always been a telltale signifier of competent governance and good governance. Lower levels of corona carriers, hospitalizations and deaths have been a norm in the northern regions so far. There has there's a couple of exceptions from that, but, but uh, clearly the Nordic Baltic region has managed to, to show uh, also competent phase, uh, phase of, of governance. And this is something that, that it will be remembered in this region and also beyond, uh, depending, of course, on, on how the uh, second wave or possible uh, third wave be, before we have uh, um, medications or uh, vaccinations available is going to carry itself out. But those words uh, concerning the situation and, and what it has revealed, I would like to yield the floor uh, to, to our next speaker. So uh, good luck and I have uh, enjoyed the forum from my perspective. Thank you uh, very much, Mika, for uh, the nice introductory, introductory words. And I would also like to warmly welcome all of the participants in our um, honored speakers uh, today. Um, also, on behalf of Institute für Europäische Politik, where I'm one of the two directors. Um, and I'm uh, happy and delighted to be able to um, open this opening session of this year's German Nordic Baltic Forum. The German Nordic Baltic Forum is a multilateral discussion format that assembles experts and so-called planners, which are representatives from ministries and their planning staffs from Germany, as well as the Nordic Baltic uh, and Baltic countries, with the aim to discuss national perspectives on current challenges um, and opportunities to the European Union. This forum provides room for identifying where national interests of the involved countries diverge and where we can find common ground for common action. In 2020, we did not have to dig very deep to identify challenges that could guide our discussions. The COVID-19 pandemic, as has uh, just been um, described, is impacting all of our everyday lives and has also challenged the EU member states to agree on common actions uh, because it's basically, it's considered to be a symmetric crisis with asymmetric effects that we then base, uh, all have to, to deal with. with. This means on the one hand, the pandemic might have intensified or um, accelerated existing crisis or challenges in the European Union, or at least pointed out um, at uh, those areas where reform is urgently needed. On the other hand, the pandemic has also called for common action that might even drive European integration further. At the same time, we also have to look beyond the pandemic in order to grasp the full picture of challenges and opportunities for the future of the um, European Union. We identified four broader topics that we think deserve more detailed discussions, and that is the European Green Deal, the EU and multilateralism, the EU's resilience and the economic, uh, economic recovery. There is this common saying um, of, uh, that we should never waste a good crisis. And I think we should not waste this pandemic for discussing the future of the European Union. Within this forum, we do not want to exclusively discuss behind closed doors, that, which we're going to do tomorrow and also in December, but traditionally open the forum with a public debate where we can find inspiration for our discussions, both in the keynote addresses as well as the questions from the broader audience. This year, however, and there are some things that are new. First of all, we meet virtually instead of face-to-face. Uh, uh, and we also want to include younger perspectives into the debate and therefore ask young experts as well as one rapporteur from the Engage Your Council project to pro provide first comments to the keynote addresses in order to kif kick us off uh, for our broader discussion. Before introducing our today's speakers, please allow me to thank our partner institute, the Finnish Institute of International Affairs in Helsinki, who would have liked uh, to host us in Helsinki actually, but is now our virtual host um, today. Let me also thank uh, the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin and the Finnish Ministry of, for of Foreign Affairs for the kind support um, to the German Nordic Baltic Forum. I also need to remind ourselves of the technical rules that will allow us to communicate smoothly during the discussion. So please turn off your cameras if you're not um, a speaker and you haven't done so already. Please mute your mics whenever you're not speaking. 
If you want to participate in the Q&A part of the discussion, discussion later, you can do so in two ways. Either identify in the chat function that you would want to ask a question orally, or you can spell out um, your question directly in the chat function, and I'm going to address, uh, address your question in the discussion. As we will have to close the session today at four, um, four o'clock, I'm not going to lose any more time, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome our two teen, uh, keynote speakers. Um, and I'm, I know that both of you must be very busy, um, and also uh, um, Minister Roth, with regards to the German presidency, I'm sure that uh, there are many things to do at the moment. Um, but so we are very on honored that you actually took your time to uh, participate in this um, discussion and share um, your thoughts um, on um, the general topic that we found for this forum, 2020 as a stress test for the European Union challenges in the in times of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I'm very delighted to first hand over the floor to Titi Tuparainen, who is Minister for European Affairs and Ownership Steering at the Prime Minister's Office in Finland. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Chair. Vielen Dank, meine Damen und Herren, ladies and gentlemen. This year has been exceptional. This is the year of the pandemic. Next year will not be a walk in the park either. Nevertheless, we should aim at coming out of the crisis as a union that is more resilient. And I have three points on this. First is the fundamental role of the rule of law. Second, I will argue that an open economy is a prerequisite for resilience. And finally, in my view, you should not fall between US-China disputes, but act strongly according to our values. First, rule of law provides predictability and trust to our mutually dependent economies. It is a basic requirement for a functioning single market and for our credibility as trading partner. However, it is not just about markets. The European Union is first and foremost a union of values. The rule of law is the core principle of our societies. It is the foundation of any free society. As 27 member states met in last July, the, make the decision about the MFF and the recovery fund, we were convinced that these decisions were necessary to defend the solidarity within our union. And we were equally convinced that the union worth defending is a union founded on the principle of rule of law. Our common values are the bedrock of resilience. I am delighted that the German EU presidency has put rule of law high on its agenda. Minister Roth, lieber Michael, die Rechtsstaatlichkeit wollen wir fest entschlossen verteidigen, um gemeinsam Europa wieder stark zu machen. Second, they say EU evolves as a result of crisis and it is proving to be true once again. Personally, I do not like the idea of rooting for crisis to propel us ahead. But resilience has quickly become a common and cross-cutting top priority as we are tackling this latest crisis. My message is the basic elements for strengthening the union's resilience are more or less the same as the elements for enhancing growth, competitiveness and the ultimate goal, our well-being. The union has been able to rise to the occasion by agreeing upon a recovery package which forms our common fiscal policy response to the crisis. The investments facilitated by it will enhance our competitiveness and transform our economies to be more sustainable or more resilient, so to speak. While we coordinate our fiscal policies and investments like never before, we should not forget the EU's traditional core businesses, namely strengthening the single market and promoting free, fair and rules-based global trade. These are policy areas where the EU can offer real added value to each of its member states while contributing to the EU's prosperity and resilience. When talking about resilience, one cannot avoid referring to strategic autonomy, a concept initially used in the field of security and defence policy. In the current debate, it is not always clear what is concretely meant by strategic autonomy. I tend to think 
that resilience and strategic autonomy are two different issues. Part of the discussion around strategic autonomy or sovereignty is linked to the unfair global competition. But I don't think that our answer on leveling the playing field should be compromising the competition or the competition policy or state aid rules. What is reasonable, however, is that the third country operators doing business in the single market play under the same rules that the European counterparts are required to do. We should be asking for reciprocity. Neither do I consider it realistic to return the production of value chains back home as it hardly brings us sovereignty in the longer run. This was actually one of the main findings of the recent publication by ECIPE, which confirmed that global value chains have kept Europe indeed more resilient during the pandemic. Having said this, it is still evident that there are certain critical sectors where production capacity needs our attention. One can think of sectors closely connected to health and safety. So for me, strategic autonomy is not about building walls and barriers around fortress Europe. Instead, it is about improving our competitiveness and investing in innovation so that we are a global trading partner that nobody can ignore. In a nutshell, I call us to, re to remain vigilant to the risk of strategic autonomy ending up being protectionism. Third point. Some have called for the EU to provide a third way in disputes between the US and China. High Representative Borrell has written an interesting piece arguing in favor of the EU's Sinatra doctrine, of course a reference to his famous song, My Way. The EU should not fall victim to the US-China disputes, which have been very harmful to multilateral rules-based governance, which we all depend on. We should definitely find our own way, tell what kind of a world and global order we want to build, and then use all our instruments to promote our goals. Let me take an example. The fact is that data has become globally a key resource. On the global states, there are differing approaches to data. On the one hand, in the East, we have a rising superpower where the state has significant control over data. Across the Atlantic, the field is dominated by tech giants with very light regulatory coverage. We are clearly lacking a comprehensive global data governance model. This is an opportunity the EU should seize, just like we did when creating a GDPR regime, which major economies are now following. The EU can fulfill the vacuum by providing a model where people can have control over their own data, and the regulation is based on the principles of trust and privacy, freedom of speech and human dignity. Ladies and gentlemen, finding our own way should not mean Europe first, not in the spirit of the famous red baseball caps. Our success will always depend on cooperation to solve the global challenges of our times. The EU must show leadership in building coalitions and partnerships in support of effective multilateralism. Germany has done a lot in this regard under the Alliance for Multilateralism. Thank you for that, Michal. Neither should the EU's position in the world be described as a neutral third way in between US and China. With that policy, in a world that may split into two, Europe would fall into abyss. We must look at the world based on our own values and our own point of view and act accordingly. We must be principled to our own values and interests towards all global players. Often our interests coincide with the US. The transatlantic bond is deep, but that's not always the case. I don't make any forecast for the US presidential elections, but I don't think it is altogether impossible that we will have a US government more willing to cooperate with Europe. Should this opportunity arise, we should not spare our ambition. One such action should be re-entering negotiations on a comprehensive EU-US trade and investment agreement. 
A successful agreement would persuade China to follow Euro-Atlantic standards in trade and investment regulation. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1969, Henry Kissinger said, there cannot be a crisis next week. My schedule is already full. He sure has lived a busy life. I'm convinced that we can come out of this crisis as a union that successfully builds the future on our core strengths like the rule of law, single market and open economy. A union that is able to make independent policy choices at the global level based on our interests and values and as a union that is more resilient. We recently celebrated the anniversary of the German reunification. Just like 30 years ago, we must now act, open the gate and face new Europe. In my mind, Europe shall become the most competitive, socially inclusive, carbon neutral economy in the world. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thank you very much. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much, Mrs. Uh, Tuparainen, for this uh, very comprehensive um, elaboration on the EU's resilience. And um, and you mentioned that you know um, this, uh, the the uh, schedule being full when the, the when the crisis hit or being not prepared or you know kind of you know a crisis hits when the schedule is already full. And I think that was also something that uh, applied to the German presidency when you know the program was almost drafted and then the pandemic um, hit um, the the continent and then it kind of re, uh, required. Um, well, detailed redrafting and also a recalibration of the meetings that were planned and everything. So I think this is also um, something that Germany had to dealt with, uh, deal with in the um, in the past months. But I'm also very um, interested in hearing uh, Mr. Uh, Roth's um, views on, uh, you know, the, the stress test this year and uh, the, the opportunities for the European Union ahead of us. And um, I'm very delighted to be able to give the floor to our Minister for European Affairs, uh, Mr. Roth. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Titi, for your inspiring speech and for your true uh, friendship in uh, challenging times for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very delighted to be speaking to you today at the opening of the 12th German Nordic Baltic Forum 2020. This year's forum is taking place under the special circumstances of a global pandemic that were impossible to predict just a year ago. These circumstances have shaped our joint challenges and also the priorities of the German Council Presidency. You invited me to share some optimism and some encouraging ideas with you. Let's try. The pandemic has accentuated the competition between major global powers and, as a consequence, has highlighted the need for Europe to be more sovereign, more resilient and more independent. We must strengthen our healthcare systems, diversify our supply chains and minimize dependencies in particularly critical areas. In particular, we need to ensure the availability of essential goods such as protective equipment at medicine. The fact that in July the EU member states came together to agree on an unprecedented financial package to tackle the economic and social consequences of the pandemic gives cause for optimism. The package consists of the next multi-annual financial framework and the recovery plan next generation EU. This agreement is an important manifestation of EU solidarity. This joint effort will help all member states to alleviate the challenges posed by COVID-19 and at the same time sets the course for the future of Europe. The current negotiations with the European Parliament are really complicated and complex, but I can see a spirit of common purpose on all sides. As our presidency model puts it, together 
for Europe's recovery. Also, we are still in the middle of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. We should already start to learn the lessons from this crisis. We have to make sure our economies recover in a sustainable manner, in line with the Green Deal and with a clear focus on social cohesion. Even though COVID-19 is putting our economies, our health and our social life under considerable strain with regard to climate change, we should use it as an opportunity, a chance to foster the green transition of our economies, a chance for a real ecological turnaround that reconciles economic growth with environmental needs. It's important to stress that this is not about an either or decision between the Green Deal and recovery programs. It's essential that the EU remains on track to achieve substantial emissions reductions that is of 55% by 2030 and actively supports the goals set by the Paris Climate Agreement. We need to act now for the future. Especially in these difficult times, it's important not to lose sight of our common goals and values. And for me, the fact that we are managing to make progress on important issues, even in times of crisis, is yet another cause for optimism. Especially in times like these, when democracy and the rule of law are under pressure, are under pressure by nationalists and populists, Europe needs to defend these fundamental values to protect our common democratic achievements, past and present. The EU is first and foremost a union of common values. We're not just a single market, not just a currency union. The new format of the rule of, and we would like to, to implement two new tools. The first one is the so-called rule of law conditionality embedded into the MFF and the recovery package. And the second new tool is the so-called rule of law dialogue, the rule of law check based on the commission's rule of law report. It's a major step forward in regaining a common, a mutual understanding of the rule of law in the European Union. With the first horizontal debate in October and with the exchange on individual countries' chapters, which are due to start on the 10th of November, a precedent will be set. We will consolidate it together with the upcoming presidencies. What we also need in this changing world is resilient societies, both online and offline. And it's paramount that in our union of common values, the EU preserves and even strengthens its commitment to the rule of law in all member states, an issue which is very dear to my heart. The EU is also facing an increasing number of external challenges. Only together can we be a strong advocate for European values and successfully face these challenges on the global stage. And here, Europe must not allow itself to be divided. Recent developments in relation to China, to Russia, or to Turkey, but also to the United States, are testing our capacity to act and will continue to do so in the future. We therefore have to improve our capacity to act together on foreign and security policy issues. If we want to make the world a better place, we have to stand united. We have to overcome our disputes. Furthermore, we need to accelerate the building of our technological sovereignty and digital transformation as the pandemic has shown. Let's not see this crisis as a setback. I can't argue more with Tutti. Rather, let's view it as a wake-up call to stand up for our European approach to current challenges based on our common values and led by our joint interests. Together, 
we will be able to find solutions. We need to set the course for the future right now. 12 years after the German Nordic Baltic Forum, it's quite a legacy. This just underlines the importance of these valuable exchange formats. I'm very much convinced that an in-depth exchange between Nordic, Baltic and German representatives will bring positive and progressive ideas to feed into this debate on the future of a united, sovereign and resilient Europe. I hope for new ideas and inspiration from your discussion today and I'm very much looking forward to learning more about your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roth, for this uh, sharing your optimism uh, with uh, with us, but also uh, sharing, you know, your your feeling for urgency for for the need to to act. And I think both of you were very explicit, and I think you both agreed on the importance of the rule of law issues or issue for the resilience of uh, the European Union. And I think this is something that we're definitely going to discuss um, also in the um, upcoming sessions. But um, I would now like to first hand the floor to our uh, commentators um, in order to hear um, their thoughts on what they have heard uh, right now and also on certain topics. Um, before I um, open the floor to um, to the broader public. But while uh, we are listening to the commentators, you can already, um, I already invite you to uh, frame your questions and identify yourself in the chat um, if you want to ask a question so that we can enter into the discussion without any uh, further delay after the, the comments. But first, I would like to hand over to uh, Pirit Kusik, uh, who is a junior research fellow at um, the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute in, in, in Estonia. And uh, she is not new to the forum, actually, because she was uh, co-organizing the forum uh, last year with IEP together and um, also contributed to uh, lively to, to the discussions. Her research focuses on EU's foreign and security policy, german franco relationship and Baltic Sea region's role in Europe and, and the world. And um, uh, Pirit, I would be interested, I mean, we heard lots of things about the rule of law issues right now, but maybe you would want also to pick up more on uh, the second issue that Mrs. Superreinen was also referring to, the open economy, uh, economy, the economic recovery, but just share your, your uh, spontaneous thoughts with us and your comments to what you've just heard. Indeed, uh, greeting from Tallinn. Um, as said, both ministers mentioned the economic recovery and, um, and I have to say that I cannot help not wonder is that uh, we are just coming out of another crisis, which is the financial crisis almost a decade ago, and we're still dealing with the political consequences of the crisis. And what worries me increasingly is that we're not really, or is the European Union really thinking ahead of what that coming crisis will mean to people's real lives? If I follow the debates in Brussels today, Green Deal is one of the central drivers of the debate. Um, but at the same time, it is somewhat abstract to a general citizen. And, um, and I am a tad afraid that while we talk about the future and the Green Deal, that the European Union might miss the reality that people and the challenges that the citizens are facing. And to some extent, the European Union will not be able to actually speak to the people. And the reason why, I'm, why I'm, I've come to this thought is that Estonia's government has signed up to the Green Deal and at the European level we are very pro-Green Deal. However, it is not the, the issue that the government and the party gained its electoral victory. And so if you go to and talk to an Estonian citizen, 
I'm pretty sure that they have no knowledge about the Green Deal. And my worry is, how do we meet those two? Thank you. Thank you, Pirit, for the very um, yeah, concise uh, comment and also uh, raising the concern between you know, um, how to meet politics with the public opinion and how to bring the two sides together and the concerns uh, that um, exist within the, the population in, in the different uh, countries. Um, I would like to hand over to uh, Kalle Hakansson, who is um, Associate Fellow at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and a PhD candidate at Malmö University. And his research focuses on EU foreign and security policy, uh, particularly in relation to the European Commission's growing role. But I think uh, you um, are very apt to uh, comment more maybe on uh, Europe, uh, Europe's role in the world and what that actually means um, in, in view of the current challenges and what you have just uh, heard. Thank you, Funda. Uh, and thanks to the Institute for European Politik and Thea for inviting me to participate in this opening session. Uh, and also thanks to the ministers for their very interesting uh, opening remarks. First of all, I just want to say that I think this is a great forum to enhance and deepen uh, relations and understanding between these different countries and, and regions which can serve as a stepping stone uh, uh, and provoke new ideas and thoughts. Uh, as you said, I will try to uh, have some ideas and thoughts on one of the key subjects of this year's German Nordic Baltic Forum, uh, the issue of uh, Europe in the world. I really think that we need a more confident Europe and European Union in, in world affairs. The past couple of years, we have seen the deepening of uh, cooperation in the field of uh, foreign security and defense policy on the EU level, with the launch of new initiatives and uh, tools such as PESCO, the European Defense Fund, and so on. However, we must be aware of a kind of a mission complete syndrome. Just that we have these different forums of cooperation doesn't make it finished. This is something that I really see as a risk among uh, a lot of the member states. Hence, we need to continue to, to work hard on these efforts ahead. Uh, and I was, of course, a bit disappointed with the MFF uh, and the overall budget decided this summer, uh, which reduced the funding for in new instruments such as the European Defense Fund, uh, military mobility and the European Peace Facility. However, I still think that we should see the glasses half full and not half empty, uh, so to say that we still see quite substantial EU financing in this field is something that, that we should recognize. Uh, and furthermore, I think it's important to leave the, the semantics behind and focus on the real issues. For example, uh, the, the suspicion of the concept of EU strategic autonomy has long been rather high among some of the member states, among them Sweden. Uh, and this pa has partly led to a major conceptual debate in recent years instead of focusing on what the EU and its member states really want to achieve. A possible solution to this could be the process that the EU during the German presidency right now is, is initiated with development of a strategic compass in uh, security and defense. I would say that this is a needed process uh, which hopefully could uh, could complement and strengthening the, the EU global strategy. Uh, in this way, I also think it's it's maybe it's good that we maybe are seeing the, the Franco-German engine gearing up again in this uh, policy field. However, I also think that Sweden, as well as the other Nordic and Baltic states, really need to be proactive and engage in this uh, debate and process uh, to real, really be able to influence this. Likewise, so in the in the upcoming conference of the future of Europe. Uh, so with that, I'm looking forward to the further discussions in the rest of the forum. Uh, I think it will be a great addition of the forum, despite that we cannot meet in Helsinki uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you, Kalle. I think yes, we all kind of. Uh, uh, 
uh, yeah, not happy or uh, not so happy about the fact that we cannot meet in Helsinki. But I think virtual meeting is also something that we kind of gotten used to and uh, have to uh, to work with. But um, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts on uh, on Europe's uh, role in the world and also taking up the idea of strategic autonomy that was also um, already mentioned. Um, now, last but not least, I would like to um, give the, the floor to uh, one of our young rapporteurs from uh, a project that um, we are coordinating at IEP, which we called Engage Your Council. And within this project, we are bringing together um, three groups, or well, three times groups of um, people to um, elaborate uh, their ideas and the young ideas for um, the upcoming presidency. And Marja Oshberg, I hope I'm kind of pronouncing your, your name uh, correctly, but please correct me if I'm wrong, um, is one of the rapporteurs of the first group who was very busy this summer, first of all, getting acquainted to being part of a virtual think tank, and second of all, um, coming up with their ideas uh, that the German presidency um, should be addressing um, during this six months. And currently, the second group is busy um, uh, def defining and identifying their ideas uh, and recommendations for the Portuguese uh, presidency. So I'm very happy that Maja um, decided to join us today in order to um, share um, her insights on the young ideas that they um uh, elaborated uh, during the first half of this year and um, also discuss them with us today. So thank you and you have the floor. Um, thank you, Dr. Tekin, and special thanks to both ministers for their engaging opening remarks. Um, I think we can all agree that we do live in challenging times and that this crisis has been a real stress test for the EU, be it economically, socially or even geopolitically. Uh, when the EU is trying to manage this current crisis and advance forward-looking ideas for its future, uh, 24 participants of the Engage EU Council project identified urgent challenges such as the promotion of the green recovery after the pandemic and achieving greater strategic autonomy of the EU as a foreign policy actor, and then develop ideas, which I will shortly present today, for how to turn this crisis into an opportunity for the EU. As it has already been emphasized several times, um, green transition needs to remain a key focus for the recovery and the MFF by using more funds for an industrial policy focus on green businesses and technologies, for a climate-friendly ag agriculture, and also for a deeper energy union that is focused on renewable energy. Another key element is transport. Here, the vision should be a sustainably interconnected Europe where rail travel can compete with plane travel, both in terms of duration and pricing. And there should also be focus more on participatory policy making in this matter, be it in establishing new forms of citizens' assemblies through the Conference on the Future of Europe, or making citizens more aware of the consultation process in the ordinary legislative procedure. Then when it comes to the EU's role on the global stage, a recent quote from the president of the European Council comes to mind when he said that Europe is a major player but doesn't yet know that it is. And for that, the EU needs to overcome its internal challenges by, for example, introducing qualified majority voting in some foreign policy decisions. It should also actively defend multilateral institutions and promote its values through strategic use of the already existing external action tools such as strengthen its capacity to deploy military and civilian CSDP missions, better utilize coalitions and multilateral formats to pursue reforms of institutions and arrangements such as the WTO, and undertake an even more ambitious climate diplomacy in free trade talks and agreements. And last but not least, focus should also be given to the reform of the EU official development assistance by implementing the Group of Wise Persons report on this matter and especially give focus to the political and strategic guidance on development policy. So in these times, there is a clear need to use the recovery to achieve a green transition and solve long-standing problems. It needs to be made sure that the two major underpinnings of EU future, so the MFF and the conference, are fully utilized in order for the EU to pass this test with an excellent grade.
Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Masha, for, um, well, kind of uh, re-emphasizing things uh, that we have already heard, uh, but also bringing um, new topics uh, to our key terms uh, to the discussion that we have not um, uh, come across yet, like the Conference on the Future of Europe, uh, for example. So uh, thank you very much for this broad um, discussion. So there is one um, question in the um, chat um, forum, but um, I'm going to give uh, the audience a bit more time to think about questions and uh, that they would want to, uh, might want to raise and would uh, return the floor right away to uh, back to the two ministers for uh, initial reactions to things they have just heard with regards uh, to the comments or things they would want to elaborate more in reaction uh, to the comments. So, uh, Mrs. Tuparainen, if you would want to have the floor again. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for your valuable remarks. And, lieber Michael, vielen Dank für eine sehr gute Rede. It is always a pleasure. To, to discuss with you and others. And I'm uh, ever more grateful that we are so strongly united on the rule of law. You wrote, rule of law, like I said in my speech, is the core foundation of our union and it needs to be defended right now. We have to be uh, uh, determined, yet we also have to have patience because these are problems that are not solved over one night. So we, act, we have to act with uh, a lot of patience but determined. I would just like to, to comment on, on the unity of the union, because only when we are united can we act strongly at the global level in the sense of strategic autonomy. If we want to gain you know, autonomy in the sense of uh, foreign and security and defense policy, unity is the priority number one. If we want to gain um, importance as a global trading partner, unity again is, is a factor that we cannot uh, ignore. So let's cherish the, the unity of our union because it is of utmost importance. Thank you, Minister Tuparainen. And uh, Mr. Roth, did you want to come in with initial remarks and reactions? Yeah, uh, my appreciation to uh, all participants for their comments and for their critical statements. That's extremely valuable. Um, I would like to uh, point out uh, just uh, two, two, two topics. The first one is um, climate and the second one is um, multilateralism. Um, climate, uh, we shouldn't uh, underestimate um, um, Europe's role as, as a role model, as an innovator. And um, I'm very, very proud of the new MFF. We are going to establish a new tool, a new instrument with a strong link to climate within the budget. We never had uh, on the regional level, on the local level or on the national level, a 30% linkage to climate in the MFF. With respect to agriculture uh, policy, 40%. That's a, uh, 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 that's a great chance for all of us. But now we need a functioning and also efficient instrument in order to make clear that this is just m more than a lip service. And that is one of the key elements in our negotiations with the European Parliament. But um, we have to send a clear message to the people in Europe who are afraid of losing their jobs in a very, very deep economic and social crisis that the socio-ecological transformation of our economies is a huge chance for all of us to create new chance. And it's a unique chance for us to strengthen our competition in a globalized world. And that brings me to the second uh, topic, uh, multilateralism. Um, I'm a bit uh, disappointed that we... Um, 
don't discuss it uh, in a more controversial and also inspiring way because the EU is the biggest champion of multilateralism in the world. Multilateralism is in our uh, DNA. In the Council conclusions of uh, June 2019, we identified certain areas where we want to intensify our er efforts to strengthen the multilateral system. Three of these areas strike me as particularly important. First, given that the EU is the most active advocate of multilateralism, we need a well-coordinated and strong EU presence in multilateral organizations. This also means we have to cooperate better when it comes to filling leadership positions and proposing EU candidates for them. Second, Europe now only represents a fraction of members of the United Nations. This means we need to build a network of partnerships across the globe to advance a positive international agenda. This is why we have initiated the Alliance for Multilateralism, which is a format that brings together foreign ministers from around the world who are committed to multilateralism. And third, we need to reform international organizations so that they are able to provide us with solutions for the challenges of today and tomorrow. This means that we as the EU must actively support the lessons learned process within the WHO as well as the reform of WTO, the World Bank and the United Nations system. So um, maybe the pandemic can promote uh, all these ideas because nobody should stand alone and we have to learn our lessons. And um, my big thanks to 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 Tutti. Uh, she is one of the most distinguished um, fighters for a European Union, uh, which stands for uh, common values for the rule of law. It's extremely important that we uh, defend and protect uh, the rule of law within the European Union to regain trust and confidence uh, on the global stage. But it's extremely controversial. We have to invent a lot of time and energy to convince others that the European Union is not just an economic project. Again, we are a political project based on common values and we have to defend them. And uh, that is, this is very, very, very challenging and demanding in these times because we are very much focused in this crisis mode on economic issues, on social issues, on health issues. We coordinate the whole day, but at the end, we shouldn't um, forget that we are much more than than uh, economic, um, um, an economic project or um, an institution which um, provides money for forward-looking projects. Thank you very much for this uh, very clear um, elaboration also on the issue of multilateralism and trying to give us some inspiration of uh, what to deal with. And uh, it seems to me uh, you might have kind of had an eye on the chat because uh, I think that you uh, already answered um, the question that Juha Jokela uh, was, uh, was um, um, questioning or putting into the chat because he was exactly asking uh, what would be uh, your priority areas and institutions in defending rules-based order and multilateralism. So that was exactly um, your, your answer um, to, to that question. Um, and he just confirms. <laughs> we have one uh, remaining question um, in in the chat that is more, I mean, also in view of um, the economic recovery and the Green Deal is more uh, putting an eye on um, energy mixes and in how far Germany, uh, for I mean, giving the example of Germany, uh, who is moving from nuclear power to Russian gas and Finnish owned coal, Uh, could Germany make a green deal and use recovery money to modernize the existing emission-free nuclear plants and show that the recovery money must be used to return given, giving green investments? So basically, it's more a question how far um, also energy um, uh, mixes um, of a, um, a country could, um, could contribute um, to um, the green deal issue and also that the recovery monies are invested um, 
um, correctly or with an eye to, to the future development. Um, I don't see any um, further questions with regards um, uh, from, from the broader audience. So um, I would uh, simply like to um, give uh, the ministers a final one sentence or two sentence uh, opportunity for their um, final remarks. So um, again, Mrs. Tuparainen, if you would want to um, give your concluding remarks for this discussion. Thank you very much. Very shortly, if I may, I would just like to comment on what, what Piret said in her comment in the beginning, how to speak to the people. And there's one word and it's, it's just transition. And I'm very happy that we have a new fund, the Just Transition Fund in the MFF and recovery package. Um, that is the way to address the audience. We have to uh, take into account that that green transition, it's not just winning, there are sectors that are losing and we have to make it socially uh, sustainable and that's where the just transition comes into the scene. But I would just like to conclude and, and once again invite us all to create a strategy which makes the EU world's most competitive, socially inclusive, carbon, neut carbon neutral economy in the world. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Mrs. Tuperainen. And uh, now, Michael Roth, uh, one uh, final concluding remark. Uh, thank you so much. The um, statement sounds a bit weird in my uh, ears because Germany is the only uh, uh, country uh, worldwide who sent a very clear message. The age of coal and the age of nuclear um, energy will be over. And this is extremely challenging for our economy. That is extremely challenging for uh, our societies. That's why we are very much in favor of renewable energy. And we, we uh, build up um, new sources. Um, we established a functioning and very, very successful uh, legal system in order to make uh, renewable energy as a success story, not just for the national stage, but also for Europe to encourage rich others on the global stage. But, and um, this is another uh, dimension of this very important uh, and crucial uh, discussion, gas serves as a bridge builder between the existing energy mix and um, the Green Deal, uh, a bright future without coal, a bright future without nuclear energy, but we need uh, gas in the midterm. And that's why we are um, um, very much uh, in interested in a more European uh, energy uh, strategy, uh, energy uh, supplies. This is not just uh, a national uh, challenge, it is much more an obligation for all of us in the European Union to uh, establish um, a system and a strategy which bases on, um, on, on, on solidarity, uh, but also efficiency and sustainability. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for uh, the two ministers who uh, shared their time with us and their thoughts with us, uh, which we are um, all going to uh, take with us into our uh, discussions uh, tomorrow. I am also uh, want to thank uh, our three commentators for um, their contributions, and uh, we are uh, mostly happily also taking uh, these comments uh, into our further discussions. And um, we're actually going to elaborate a discussion paper, which we're going to share uh, with the broader public, so you can watch out for that. But um, for now, I would like to uh, thank everybody and wish you all a nice evening. Thank you very much.